Well, thank you for coming after lunch. I hope you all stay awake. So this is uh, a lot of fun for me. I, I game in. Thank you for the opportunity to come back and, and share with uh, this group. Um, I was a student here many years ago. Um, I see a lot of professors in the audience, so I feel like I'm in my dissertation defense again. This is becoming very stressful all of a sudden. Uh, so just a little bit about me. Um, my name is Nate Oda. I'm the CTO at an at a Internet of Things company called Radio Thermostat. We specialize in thermostats that uh, communicate to iPhone apps and to home automation systems, to the smart grid, and to all sorts of things that you might communicate uh, with a thermostat. Um, prior to radio thermostat, I spent a number of years in the smart grid industry doing smart electric meters. Uh, so big investments, utilities putting in their own communications networks, and you want to run uh, home area networks or demand response over the smart grid. And so I designed and, and architected a lot of the stuff in Canada, uh, Europe, and some places in the Northeast. Um, so it did, did smart meters for about four years. I uh, had a chance to do some um, policy work there. Uh, I was on uh, a board called the Demand Response Smart Grid Coalition. Um, we did uh, legislation in Washington, D.C. Um, had a chance to sit on uh, the technical group for uh, what's called Open Home Area Network. It was the uh, standards group from uh, uh, the federal government to, to develop standards for um, utilities and home area networks. Uh, and before that, uh, I think most of you saw my rather embarrassing video um, from the morning session when I was a student here at Berkeley, uh, working with Paul Wright. And I was a, a Citrus student and a peer funded, and Ron and, and the whole group, we, we did the original uh, demand response research without funding. Um, so that was in 2007 I graduated, so it's been a few years. Um, just a bit about the company I work for, uh, it's Radio Thermostat Company of America. We make thermostats with radios. It's been around for a long time. We design, manufacture, uh, distribute. Um, we do our manufacturing in China. We have headquarters here in San Francisco, um, and then operations throughout the US. And the company's been around for quite some time, uh, since the 70s, manufacturing consumer electronics. It wasn't until about the 2000s uh, that the company really got into communicating thermostats, largely uh, being pushed into the market by um, very early what we would become to call smart grid companies who wanted to communicate to thermostats. Um, hopefully today I can, I can share two stories with you uh, that might give you a little different perspective. Um, a lot of the research that goes on here is very technical and you've heard a lot of great talks this morning. Um, but there's all kinds of companies in, uh, in the industry right now uh, focusing on the thermostat, um, whether it's energy retailers or MSOs like AT&T providing smart thermostats. It's really central to uh, many billion dollar industries all focusing on one device in your home. Um, I think most people here are aware that's going to continue as, as you have more LED lighting going to houses, as you have more efficient uh, washing machines, uh, the fraction of energy used uh, will increase for heating and, and air conditioning, uh, as well as the, the money that's being shelled out by individual consumers uh, each month. So it's, it's a very uh, sought after device um, to control in, a, in somebody's home. Um, but what I wanna do is, is talk about two stories. One, one we're gonna rewind to about 2007, and I think you'll find it interesting because it really was the path of uh, how do you architect large-scale systems and what are the ramifications on that. And the second story uh, we'll talk about, or I'll talk about, is uh, something more today around Title 24. Um, so the first one is privacy and security. And this is a really hot topic now around connected devices. Um, who owns the data? What kind of data are you sharing? Um, and it's really uh, the story about how system architectures, uh, so smart grid and the like, uh, influenced how consumers saw that uh, big investment. So let's rewind to 2009. So we just had that horrible crash. 
I think most of you remember that. Um, many companies went out of business, banks failed, and the government stepped in and said, okay, we need some stimulus, let's create some jobs. Uh, as a part of that, uh, the stimulus fund had a couple billion dollars in there for uh, what's called the smart grid. So the idea of uh, an electric utility, um, most of the operations were sneaker net, meaning somebody running around in sneakers with a clipboard. Um, we could do that much more efficiently if we just had wireless communicating devices. So let's go, let's go do that. Let's build out a smart grid. Um, multiple industries came together. Um, the power sector came together with the utility sector. Um, you had the National Institute of Standards and Technology coming in. And all of a sudden you have this massive, massive group collaborating on how to basically upgrade the whole electric grid in the United States. I mean, this is once in history kind of stuff happening. And it became very complex. You have multiple markets. Uh, you know, you, you, this, this diagram by NIST puts all of bulk generation into one little icon. <laughs> and, that, and, then, and then you start to dig down and these really great smart guys got together and you start to build out system architectures. And all of a sudden you realize, wow, everything's interconnected. And everything's gonna communicate. Everything's gonna share data. And one of the areas that uh, really became interesting and became a very hot topic was in the lower right, which is the premise networks or homes, it's home area network. Um, as a part of the funding from the government, which basically was a half off sale, and it was great, right? What took six years to sell to utilities now took six months. It was uh, use it or lose it money, so people had to put this gear in. Everyone was happy, created jobs. The one catch was, uh, if you looked at any business case by any utility in the country, it had the same bar chart. And it was 80% uh, of the benefits of doing this big billion dollar meter rollout was covered by automating meter reading. But it didn't cover all the costs. 20% of the costs, roughly, were in what's called demand response. And that was said, okay, as a part of the stimulus money, uh, we've gotta do demand response or real-time electricity pricing, and we're gonna have people change their thermostats, and it's gonna be great. That's where the other 20% of the benefits are gonna come from. And so you always ended up with a picture like this, right? So the telephone pole, the power poles, the little gray boxes, um, you'd have thousands of these per network or per utility. Um, you'd have electric meters with a little red dot with the communication coming in from the utility cloud. And that cost about three or four billion dollars per utility. Nice big investment. Then the idea was you'd relay all this information into the home, house side of the meter, the blue dots. And you'd send down real-time pricing or you'd say how much are you using or give advice to the consumer. And it was this really great vision of an optimized system to help affect consumer behavior. Well, the problem then became uh, who owns the data? Who owns the data? Who gets to see the data? Who takes care of the data? So really, really simplified system architecture. You go from bulk generation and distribution grids all the way down to this really simple idea of a meter on a house sharing information into the home and maybe some information going back up to the utility to say, hey, you know, I'll participate in this energy savings event, or flex your power event, I'll, I'll do that with my thermostat. Well, the whole question about who owns that data that went through the meter was a national debate. It went all the way up to the White House and the White House issued um, an open, open comment period through the um, uh, Office of Technology and Science, I think that's what it's called. And everyone in the industry wrote comments. And it even got so far as to uh, legislation being proposed on consumers' right to access that, who owns that, and importantly, who, who can see that data, the privacy around that. So all this system architecture um, really got boiled down to the context of consumer privacy. And in the end, and we're getting close to the end of this first story, it boiled down to this picture. So this was a standards development effort by the National Institutes of Standard Technology. Um, everyone in the industry was involved. GE co-chaired this, uh, Google was on the co-chair for this effort, um, 
Reliant, which is a big utility in Texas. Uh, I was on it. Um, there's about 100 companies in the industry that were involved to create this one diagram. And what's amazing is all the consumer advocacy, all of the privacy issues are summarized here. And it's basically, and this is what happens in the real world, uh, the dotted line, the small dotted line, basically says information can only go from the electric meter into the house. Nothing comes up or down, that's it. It's the most simple, most private way of doing anything with a communicating network. And then all the way then, the solid line basically means you can go all the way from the utility, have a signal go all the way into your house, and then come all the way back out. So vastly different system architectures at one very simple endpoint, the meter on your house. And it tried to resolve these issues of privacy. Um, just as an interesting aside, the security aspect of one way versus one and a half way versus two way, um, that actually became a very hot topic for utilities worried about Trojan attacks from you know, a thermostat that had a virus that was made in China connected to your meter and it gets in and it blows up your transformer. Um, when, when I went around talking to utilities, uh, the one way was by far the winner with guys who were running the network. So the meter guys who, who had to worry about uptime on their grid, they said, absolutely, one way is the way to go. Don't do anything else. And you go talk to the, the team that had to come up with that 20% of extra benefits, and they said, uh-uh, two-way. Everything's two-way, because we've got to get the signal. We have to show uh, that we're getting this. Um, there's no one, one right way or wrong way. It was a very interesting debate. I think it's a really interesting story for, for folks here doing research in large-scale systems technologies that might de be deployed by utility or a power company. Um, what was a very simple, hey, just figure out the standard, turned into a consumer advocacy uh, issue. Um, where, where does the story end? Uh, so this whole effort was basically 2000, 2009 to 2011 or so. Um, today, uh, the whole concept of dynamic pricing, sending a price that's time-based to a consumer, um, is basically done away with. No utility that I'm aware of has any real program with that. They've all gone back to the old way. Before you had two-way communicating, it's, it's all just uh, load control. Um, no one's actually using the, the, the meters at all. Um, there's a couple people doing it. It's very spotty. Most of the stuff has gone from uh, using the meter network to do it to using Wi-Fi and what's called a bring your own thermostat model. So Wi-Fi connected. Um, one, last about, one last point about how the story ends. Um, and I think it really goes to say, you know, there is no one right way. Um, Hydro One, which is a Canadian company in Toronto, uh, they have about a million and a half meters. All of their meters uh, do the one way. So one way just into the house. Uh, in California, I think some of the meters are doing kind of a one and a half way where you can sort of get into the house and basically you're just reading the meter for the energy usage. And in a few places in Ohio, American Electric Power um, and Kansas City, they're doing a full two-way. So it really depended on what state, what privacy advocates you had in that state as to how the story unfolded. Uh, I think it's really interesting. Um, what started out as a pure technical question about what's the best architecture, ended up with uh, basically a policy on a state-by-state -state basis on how to use a meter. So hopefully that was interesting. I don't think you've heard that before. Um, the next story is uh, more today. Um, and it's around thermostats, which of course, you know, the boring old thermostat, and there's billions of dollars being fought over around the thermostats. Here it's, it's an interesting one for, for policy today, and it's Title 24. So very California, Title 24 is the building energy code. It specifies how efficient your light bulb needs to be, um, how efficient your kitchen exhaust fan needs to be, and what we're trying to do now is say, hey, we should have uh, communicating thermostats because they're really great. Um, OCT is occupancy controlled smart thermostat. So the idea that you're gonna have thermostat with a radio in it and you're going to be able to receive a signal and it's going to say hey we're about ready to have a brownout and people are going to be able to 
avoid or reduce their air conditioning usage, and we're gonna avoid brownouts, and we're not gonna have the scary stuff that happened in 2003. Great vision. The challenge comes in, and, and this is a theme here, is where technology standards come and meet policy. Uh, a lot of smart people involved in this. Um, this is an eye chart. Basically, number two and three say, here's what kind of radio you have to use, a Wi-Fi radio or a Zigbee radio, and here's what kind of protocol you need to use on top of it, something called open ADR and, and or Zigbee. Now, this is, don't worry about the jargon. Um, basically, there's a thermostat and there's a utility, and you want to get a signal from the utility down to the thermostat. Now on the left, you have an open ADR. And this is great, it was built uh, at LBNL early research. Um, a lot of the research that was peer funding was collaborative, was a sister project. It basically says, here's a device, here's what you can do on the device, and it also says, here's a whole exchange of messages, the whole sequence, step one, send a message, step two, get a acknowledgement, step three, agree on how much you're gonna save. It's a whole setup, end to end. On the right side, you have another technology that's specified in the same 24, Title 24 uh, language. However, on the right side, it only says, here's the levers on the device. It doesn't say anything about how to get a message there, how to transfer information, how to, how to actually go through this transaction of negotiating, hey, turn your thermostat down two degrees, we're about ready to have a blackout. Well, any engineer in the audience will know the power of this. This, this is a boundary line. If you make it a box, it's a bounding box. It shows the edge. It's the API, it's the interface. You can call it whatever you want. It's the interface between two things in a system. Well, if you have a thermostat and you have a cloud, everyone knows a cloud, data computation, big data, um, and you have a utility. If you draw the line here, you get companies like what's happening today, uh, having proprietary communications, locked in systems, and really it's locking in a lot of utilities. If you draw the line here, you have a commoditized device, you have an open, ADI, open API, excuse me. <clears throat> and if you really think about it, once you have the line there, you don't need the cloud in between. Just go right there, no, no need for the cloud in between, just go right to the utility. Because it's the same API, it's the same things you can do on the device. Why do you need the middle cloud? You don't. Now, these three clouds represent probably three or four billion dollars worth of venture capital investment. Spread across different kinds of. There's a couple billion dollars in companies doing this. There's a couple billion dollars in companies doing that. Um, it's, a, it's a big, big design issue. Where you put that dotted line? Do you commoditize the device or do you commoditize the cloud? If you put the line in the bottom, how much cost are you putting into that device? That's gonna cause cost to consumers to go up. What's the switching cost? And this is a big one, we don't think about this a lot. If you draw the line in the bottom, the switching cost is almost zero. If you put the line at the top, the switching cost is very, very high. So how do you switch out a whole system? If a utility just isn't, doesn't like it, doesn't, doesn't wanna use this vendor anymore, the switching cost is enormous. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. I think it's interesting just to share this with you guys. It's, it's a whole different perspective on technology that you're doing here, like we did, communicating thermostats, pretty benign, right? Pretty geeky. Who doesn't want an iPhone, iPhone control thermostat? But you put it into policy, and there's some major gaps on how you word the language and what happens in industry. Um, so the end of this story is to be determined. Title 24 is still ongoing. Um, I will leave you with this slide. And this will be my last slide and then we can talk about anything you want. Um, Title 24 in 2013 with thermostats is not new. We tried this in 2007. And a lot of smart people were involved in the 2007 effort. And it came out the Title 24 draft came out and it had this idea of a thermostat and you can plug a, a radio into it and if you didn't want that radio, you can unplug it. Um, it came out on December 14th. That's the green square. Uh, 
Friday, January 4th, um, an engineer in Alaska reads it and writes a blog post. Literally, you can look it up. And he basically says, big brother, they're going to spy on you. Why would you ever want this? Well, by the 11th, the New York Times picked this one blog entry up, and they wrote an article on it saying, big brother in California, you really got to get out. You can't let this happen. By the 15th, sorry, by the 14th, the Chronicle ran the paper. And by the 15th, I think Art Rosenfeld sent the email out saying, we're pulling it from Title 24. So lesson here, you can create really cool widgets that communicate, but at the end, if it's perceived incorrectly, just by one person, the technology and the research may never see the, the daylight. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about your technology and your research and how people might use it or how people might perceive it. So those are two short stories I want to share with you guys. I hope you found this interesting. Um, totally not technical, uh, but I don't have to be technical. I'm not a student here anymore. So. Uh, anybody have a comment or question or, hey, let's talk about resistors after this? <laughs> right, thank you. He might, he might have not. I thought it was Alaska. Oh, okay. Well, I'd, ha I'd have to relook again. I'm pretty sure it was Alaska. I have to give Ron his, his voice. Great talk. Thank you, Nate. You're welcome. Um, I'd like your opinion on the future. Mm -hmm. um, do you think we can get back to 2007 with an unpluggable radio? As what, first question. Second question is, do you think you can overcome some of the policy barriers with new types of technology? Are there any kinds of technology that you see in the horizon that might just obviate the need for the concern that people have about Big Brother? Um, to the first question about modules, uh, no. There was a third story I wanted to tell, but I only had 20 minutes. And the third story was about pluggable modules. Um, there's a whole effort around, uh, it's called a, it's a standard, CEA 2045. It actually started as a research project here to have a little radio standard that you plug into uh, a thermostat or a water heater. And there's basically two camps. One is make the radio completely modular, um, which adds cost, but you get flexibility. The other is choose a single radio, just build it in, get the lowest cost, and, and go deploy a bunch of systems. Um, what you see today in the consumer market, which is where most of this stuff is going, whether it's at Lowe's, hardware store, they have a home automation system. Staples, staples.com, printers and stuff, they have a home automation system. Um, AT&T has a home automation system. Um, these are all built in. You're, you're driving the cost down. Where there is a place for modules is in a very specific use case to tie a thermostat or a low controller or a water heater or an electric vehicle or whatever directly to the utility communication grid. And this is the one use case where there's still a lot of value in a module. And it's important because there's a lot of activity still in that very specific use case. So we sell, uh, we sell thermostats to uh, a large meter company. It's owned by Toshiba. It's called Landis and Gear. Uh, they have probably a third of the meters in the U.S. under their control, under their networks. Uh, what they're doing is putting their own proprietary radio into that module. And it makes sense that there's a standard interface. So when you go through an integration effort. Um, another example is in Hydro One Ontario. Hydro One's just one utility. Uh, Ontario, it's about the size of Texas. It has six different utilities in it. They have five different network systems, five. <laughs> and the commission there wants to have a single thermostat or a single set of vendors interface with five different radio types. And in that specific use case, modular is the right, right thing to do. Um, technology, um, no. You're never going to have a technology that's completely secure, completely privacy. I mean, the, the, it, it, it's a... Uh, What's the old, the old uh, adage? Security, through, uh, um, security through, through making it hard to find is not security at all. 
you're going to have privacy. It's a trade-off. And so it's around, there you go. It's around designing programs and systems to share or not share the right kind of information. So I'll give you an example. I think a lot of people here are interested in, in controlling devices. I don't, I don't, I don't need, I don't need, and <laughs> this is a big debate in industry, in, in the electric industry. I don't need every 10 seconds to sample my thermostat to know what my energy profile is. I don't need it every minute. I don't need it every five minutes. I don't even need it every 15 minutes. I probably need it maybe once an hour. So design a program, design systems on sharing information the right way. Not about trying to throw technology at it because you'll, it's a fool's errand to try to do that. You'll never, you always have breaches, you always have compromise. Uh oh, 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 thank God, Chris, you're not asking a question. I was really concerned. <laughs> Yours, yours are always the hard questions. I, I, was, I was talking longer because I saw you back there and I was kind of avoiding that. Oh, okay, yeah, next question, great. It seems the issue you're raising, I think of them as property line issues in terms of getting information out of, out of individual occupancies. For the meter? Any indication, and let's look across all resources, energy, water, a variety of them. From your market experience, any indication that Settings where you have shared systems, be it a office campus, a university campus, a homeowners association, where there is a need for some transparency about where resources are really going, where they are more open to these issues and the transparency that is demanded gets past these property line issues. Any indication from your experience that there's actually a demand um, for more transparency about what people are really using? Um, sort of. In the case you have a big building like this one, there's transparency, there's value to transparency uh, for different working groups. So the energy manager or the IT guy or the guy just focusing on, you know, water usage of plumbing to have transparency. I think David Culler's research on the open building is, is really a great step in that direction to kind of get that transparency. In the residential space, uh, no, I, I don't particularly share my information with my next door neighbor, nor do I really want to. Um, that's my personal opinion. Uh, that's not to say, and this will be heretic, you know, for uh, you know, an engineer, a trained engineer to say this, if a clever company comes up and figures out a way that there's a lot of value to deliver by sharing, okay, maybe. Um, but right now, just what I see in industry, there's, there's not too much transparency at the, at the house level, certainly at the building level. Does that answer your question? I think we're gonna move Maybe one, on. Maybe one more, one more from Ram. He's been patient with his arm getting tired. Okay, one, one more one. question and we, we should move on. So right quick, I mean, um, there's one of the challenges that we have seen with the modular, modular approach is that um, you're really not enabling the customer user interface because the data requirements are slightly different, um, especially when you're trying to use the modular approach to go through the utility channels, and then you still have to enable the customer user interface, and for that, the Ethernet, the broadband works pretty well, right? So what's, what's your thought on that? I mean, are you looking at uh, higher data throughputs, or is there a way- on, on the use of broadband? I'm sorry? No, not on the use of broadband. But when you use modular, for example, let's say you mm -hmm. put a Zigbee module and you're trying to connect to a meter, right? The mm -hmm. meters have a very low throughput. Mm -hmm and you really cannot enable the customer user interface features. Oh yeah. When you, when you use that pathway. So yeah. that's been one of the challenges with broadband because that's, uh, not broadband, but the modular approach mm -hmm. because that's inhibiting customer adoption of these devices. And the other thought is, I mean, what do you think about the data as a metric, using the data as a metric and the issues that it raises because that's where the EPA is going with their climate control specifications. Well, data, data as a metric is kind of an interesting, I'm not sure, you know, are you collect, you know, collect more kilobytes, the better you do? Well, uh, I mean, it's sort of, it's just sort of saying, hey, here's how we are going to send signals out, and sort of saying, hey, here's how the device actually responded. Whether it's very efficient, we also demand the same. Right? So, um, is that in, in terms of how we do data sharing and... Uh, um, so, 
I, th I think you're asking the right questions. What is the right metric for to look at some sort of investment into a, into a thermostat? Um, well, let me, let me give you kind of a, an answer. I'm not sure if you're going to like it or not, but um, when, when I was a graduate student researcher here, um, we would go talk to, to people come in and, and we would say, okay, top three benefits. Number one, energy savings. Number two, uh, I know, feel good about the environment. And number three, you kind of went like this and you go, yeah, it's convenient, but that's not, that's not real. That's, that, you know, we're engineers, right? So that's not real enough. Um, we sell our thermostats to home security companies and they come, they have a sales guy, they come knock on your door for you know, 50 bucks a month. You know, you can get a monitored alarm system and for an extra couple bucks a month, you can control your thermostat from your iPhone. Number one, convenience. Number two, feel good. Yeah, yeah, there's something about energy savings in there, but mm, we're not going to commit to it. If you commit to it, here's what happens. Um, I, won't, I won't say the name of the company, but they made a marketing claim for a certain amount of energy savings. It did not deliver that energy savings, and now they have a class action lawsuit against them for not living up to how much you said you were going to save. So I think, to your question about, you know, what do you measure on this? That, that's a great question. If you're doing research, maybe it's peak load shed. If you're looking at uh, market adoption, you might look at, you know, how many people are buying it based on a convenience feature. It, it's a great question. I don't think there's one right answer. Um, that's certainly been my experience. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Keep asking it. You'll get good answers. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you.